it's my pleasure to welcome you to the McDonald Library as we celebrate coming together uh, with Father Keneally and the publication of his book. Uh, I'm going to read it because I always feel an extra father in here. Unless you become like little children, the life of Francis J. Penn, S.J. Um, we're also here, in addition to celebrating the publication of this book, uh, celebrating a milestone birthday. Uh, some of you have seen the card. It has a zero and a nine on it. I'm not sure which order. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's there. Uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity uh, for the library to take on the role of publisher um, and supporting our institutional identity. Um, and also, it's been a joy assisting Father Keneally in that process. So uh, he may feel like we've been of assistance to him. He's been more of assistance to us. Uh, and so. We really appreciate the opportunity to, to work with him. Um, we're going to keep comments brief because mostly what the day is, is is to hear Father Keneally speak, not me, although I will have closing comments. Um, but also what was happening before, which was just fellowship. And, and, and we appreciate all of you coming in and joining in uh, today's festivity. So I'd like to welcome Father Keneally to the podium. As a concession to my age, I'm going to sit. It will be easier for me. Well, it's certainly wonderful to look out and see so many familiar faces. Uh, friends, the old friends, young friends, but all dear friends. And uh, I'm certainly glad to be here with you today. I'm very happy to be here. Of course, when you're 90 years old, you're happy to be just about anywhere. <laughs> so I, I count my blessings. I've been asked on several occasions what the uh, secret of longevity is. And upon reflection, I think I have three answers to that question. Longevity, first of all, requires many graces from a loving, benevolent God. Number two, a lot of very good luck. A lot of very good luck. And number three, a team of very talented, well-qualified doctors. <laughs> I think you put those together, you will live a long time. In the invitation to today's program, I noticed that the library informed you that I'm celebrating my 90th birthday, and um, at the same time, I've published my very first book. And I'm sure the question has occurred to some of you, if it took 90 years to produce the first book, how many years is it going to be to produce the next one? I don't think there'll be a next one. <laughs> but I, in my retirement and uh, in old age, I guess I can honestly say, I've been greatly consoled by the opportunity to learn more about and to write the life of Francis Finn. Um, he was truly an exceptional person as I learned as I worked through the book. And writing it was really a labor of love, just for that reason. And uh, his story certainly should be told. And I hope, sincerely, I've done him a measure of justice. Of course, I had heard of Father Finn earlier in life. As a high school student many years ago, I read a number of his books and was greatly influenced by them. In fact, looking back, I think I would have to say that my vocation to the Society of Jesus and to the priesthood owe a great deal to Father Finn and his influence. I didn't know it at the time, but I think it's true. Secondly, of course, down through the years, I had heard about him. What a very loving, lovable person he was with a huge army of friends. But thirdly, of course, like all you blue and white fans of Xavier University, I knew that he was the man who gave us the name Musketeers, or athletic teams. That was his work. And if you want to understand exactly how that happened, read the book. <laughs> <laughs> but as I worked through the book, I was really astounded what the man achieved when you remember that he was haunted and suffered from unmitigating bad health a lifetime. And there were frequent periods, long periods of insomnia. In light of that, it's amazing he did anything reading. But the list is long, and I'm only going to touch a few of them. First of all, of course, he wrote a library of books. You know that. 27 novels of a spiritually oriented theme for children and adolescents. And they were immediately popular. 
There was nothing like them at the time. And his books sold very, very well. They were very popular and translated into at least 10 different languages. I am not sure how popular they would be today. Uh, Percy Wynn the First was written in 1890, but they certainly had great influence down through the years. But secondly, for 25 years, Father Finn was the director of the Xavier, St. Xavier Grade School downtown, the parochial grade school. He took over at a time when there were about 1,200 students. This was a desperately poor neighborhood because it was made up of immigrants who lived along the riverfront, what they called the bottoms at that time. The very first thing he did when he became director to announce that there would be no further tuition. The school would be free to all members of the parish. There were people who thought he was absolutely mad and gone out of mind. But two things occurred. First of all, he turned out to be a very shrewd businessman, which nobody really guessed. And secondly, a very, very gifted fundraiser. <laughs> he combined the two. And one particular <coughs> idea, he decided rather than spending all the money he took in, he would accept an endowment so that St. Javier Senator Grade School was the first endowed Catholic grade school in the United States, as it was the first free grade school in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. But he wasn't finished. As he worked in the grade school, he began to be concerned about the young girls and young men who left them after eight years. And most went to work in factories downtown. He found that unacceptable. So what did he do? He founded a two-year commercial high school in St. Billy, at a time when high schools were really uncommon, both private and public. And what he did, he turned it into a commercial school, which taught young boys and girls how to work in an office, so that instead of working in factories, they could go to work in offices around the city. It was an ingenious plan, and it worked. The St. Xavier Commercial High School was immensely popular right down to the 1960s, when the introduction of high schools around the city really made it unnecessary. But fourth, and maybe in many ways the most significant, as an associate pastor of the church, he became very involved in both the spiritual and material needs of the parish. Bear in mind, these were the days before we had a social uh, safety net of any kind. And parishes and churches were really supplying that need. Complicated down there was the poverty of it. These, these were mostly immigrants, the sons and daughters of immigrants, uh, people who really had no money, and many did not speak English. At one point, there were 21 different nationalities represented in the parish. They spent a great deal of time, as did Father, helping the poor throughout the parish. He was legendary for his efforts along those lines. And I wonder if he gave the book here for me. But I think two rather interesting things. And the first is this. <coughs> what was it that really motivated him as he wrote the books in particular? What did he have in mind? What did he really want to accomplish? And I'd like to read this section from the book because I think it answers that question as well as I can answer it. It goes this way. What did Father Finn hope to achieve through his many books and stories? He certainly wanted to entertain his readers, to be sure. But his primary purpose was to teach some moral or spiritual lesson. In other words, his goal was unapologetic, unapologetically didactic. He was first and foremost a preacher of the Catholic faith, to which he was so personally committed. And behind the adventures, the misadventures, and the antics of his lovable characters, he was preaching the gospel of Jesus. Though his youthful readers were only vaguely aware of it because the story was so engrossing. His special gift as a writer they had his ability to make the, that gospel convincing and attractive to adolescents. And his message was simple enough, though it was disguised in an entertaining package. He wanted his young readers to understand that the purpose of their lives was to love and serve the God who had created them and loved them dearly. He had a talent for making virtue attractive and a gift for presenting selfless love 
as the noblest characteristic any boy or girl could ever aspire to. That's what he wanted to achieve. Did he? Well, I think he did. And I'd like to uh, read very briefly this. One of the uh, eulogies paid to him at the time of his death, see if I can find it. Or I had it marked, but I took the marker out. This is the tribute paid to him by his very dear friend, Father Francis Daly. And I think it encapsulates exactly what the man was. I'll read for you. It always seemed to me the world lost a poet in Father Finn. Father Finn. For him, the stark realities of life could never dim the wonder and the mystery of the world. Every day issued in possibilities of splendor. The dawn was fraught with promise. He faced the day's work expecting miracles, and the miracles must have come, because he never betrayed the least sign of disappointment or discouragement. Whatever gifts and accomplishments he had, his keen business sense, his talents in literature, music, and art, his ease and a crown, his power of leadership, his popularity and his friendships. All were regarded and employed solely as an agency for his religion. And he made this perfectly clear to all men. There was for him only one mill in the world, and it was God's. And all things else were just for Christ for it. It was a noble philosophy, and it gave a boyish simplicity to his life. I think that describes him as well as can be described. Before I finish, and I am going to finish very soon, <laughs> I'd like to express some sincere thanks. First of all, to the library crew for this wonderful reception this afternoon. Having worked in this building for 13 years, I know that the library always does things in a first-class way, and they outdid themselves today. Thank you. And secondly, I want to thank Ken Gibson here director of the library. Without him, this book would never have been written. It was he who encouraged it from the beginning. It was he who answered my questions patiently and boosted me up when things weren't going very well, but most of all, saw to the printing and the publishing of the book. Quite literally, this book wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Ken, and I want you to know how grateful I am. But there's another person I want to thank, and he's in the back. Mr. James Green. Would you raise your hand so people can see who you are? <laughs> Under the direction of a library a director, he was the one who helped me. We worked together on long occasions, going through the text, editing the text, proofreading the text, finally formatting the text, and he was the one who took it down to the public library to get it printed and bound. So once again, if it weren't for James, this book simply wouldn't be here. And there's one other person I want to thank, but I don't think she's here this afternoon. Uh, Lizzie died. She's, she's not. not. But she was the one, the graphic designer, who did the cover. A very clever cover. And you'll understand it better after you read the book. I want to express my thanks to her as well. And to all the rest of you for being here today, this has been a wonderful opportunity coming back to the library. And all I can say in conclusion is, God bless all. And God bless the university. Thank you. Thank you. The dean is here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm David Mangle. When I arrived um, 19 years ago, I had the privilege of meeting Father Keneally then as Associate Dean. Um, and to have been here for both of his retirements. Um, <laughs> in 2006, I believe. Um, what, what I didn't know well then, what I did know, by the way, um, as Associate Dean, part of his time, Associate Dean of two different colleges, if you look around the room, several of us here have been his successors. Um, several at the same time. He has multiple successors doing a job that he did alone. Um, those of you who know him aren't surprised by that. What, what I didn't know well then, though, is that already in 1982, as a member of the faculty of the Department of French, he had um, been promoted to associate professor 
and earned tenure. He continued to teach French throughout his time as associate dean. Um, so today is my very great privilege um, to recognize Father Camille in one more way um, with this letter from our provost, uh, Melissa Bauman, conferring on him the status of Emeritus Professor of French. That this had not previously been confirmed um, with, with this most successful uh, 30-year sabbatical. You have written a book. Quite so productively, uh, although there's lots of other things. Um, and so it was very easy for me to recommend the Provost Bauman to confer the status upon you. So it has entered the catalog and will be part of our uh, digital and physical archives for many years. Thank you very much. There's no time. sign the card if you have it. <laughs> Ken asked me to lead you all in singing happy birthday and I said I would rather be fired. <laughs> I would like to invite members of the Xavier Choir to please come up. Even if we have to wear masks, it's, it's, it's lovely to see people. Thank you for coming. But um, I do want to echo Father's uh, recognizing James for his significant contributions in, in editing and getting the book printed and, and working with the public library using their espresso book machine uh, to do so. It's a great uh, opportunity for the library to collaborate with another library. So that was wonderful. And thank you, James, for all that work you did. I also want to thank our university archivist and special collections librarian who worked with Father Keneally before his second retirement um, <laughs> and providing uh, archives uh, assistance and research uh, as Father was working on the book, Anne Wright Post. And there's some place. There she is. Thank you, Anne, for your help. And also, I would like to recognize and thank um, Allison Morgan and Jennifer Blossy for their work in setting up uh, the event here today and, and so that it looks so nice. Without them, uh, we would be just uh, standing around. So they did a great job uh, in making this a, a celebratory uh, space. Um, if you didn't get a book, there are a few copies left. First come, first serve. Uh, when I'm finished speaking, Father will go back and, and, and have an opportunity to sign your book. If you decide later on you want to buy a whole bunch for Christmas presents, you can do so by going to the public library and print on demand while you wait. Uh, and I think it's at cost of $16. That's the public library downtown at their espresso book machine. So you can just do so uh, for that. Um, I should also mention that within the past week, Father Keneally was interviewed uh, about his book, and will uh, there'll be a forthcoming article in the November Catholic Telegraph that comes out at the end of October, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, I'm excited to, to see uh, uh, what else you revealed in that uh, interview, but um, uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, honor uh, to, to have you um, talk about it so that many others can read about it and uh, uh, 
hopefully buy some more books. So, uh, and uh, again, as I said from the outset, we're really here just to fellowship with one another, fellowship with, with Father Keneally. So at this time, he will sign some more copies. If you didn't get a chance, as James said, you know, sign the birthday card. Also, uh, take a macaroon or two, or, and, and, and we have some refreshments. Please help us so we don't have to carry any of that back. Uh, I understand macaroons are a favorite of yours, Father, so they are. So we, may, we, we, we may save him one or two, but we do want you, we do want you to, uh, to hang around and just mingle and, and, and talk and, and enjoy each other's company. And uh, appreciate all of you coming again. Thank you so much. Thank you.